For many years, God sent his prophets to warn his people in Jerusalem that their city would be destroyed because of their apostasy. Isaiah was one of the first to warn of coming judgment. The prophet who spoke more about Jerusalem's destruction than any other was Jeremiah, the prophet of doom. For forty years, he bore witness to the truth in a time of unparalleled apostasy. He was hated, rejected, and persecuted, yet the words he spoke were the words of God. While a captive in Babylon, Ezekiel also predicted in graphic details the destruction and slaughter of Jerusalem's inhabitants. Ezekiel made very plain the folly of trusting the false predictions of those who were causing the captives to hope for an early return to Jerusalem. In 586 BC, the Day of Judgment finally arrived. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took the city and leveled it to the ground, carrying all the gold and silver and all remaining Jews into captivity. The word of God was finally fulfilled. The abominations that filled the land were finally removed. You know, Isabel, from what we have shown in this series, Ellen White was right when she said, the church is in the Laodicean state. The presence of God is not in her midst. Yes, and it's a terrible condition to be in because most people don't realize they're so destitute. That's true. It reminds me of the condition of the people just before Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. How's that? Well, the people back then felt secure because they were God's people. They didn't think God would allow the Babylonians to destroy his city, a place called by his name. But it was destroyed. Yes, it was. The people's false sense of security emboldened them to commit abominations that caused those faithful to God to sigh and cry. History is repeating itself this time in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, Ernie, God warned His people that destruction was coming, but they refused to believe the warning. I wonder whether this has any implications for us today. Oh, oh sure it does. Do you think we should look at these issues in this last episode? Isabel, I think that would be a great way to bring this series to an end. Why don't you look into what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy says about the condition of the church prior to the close of probation, and I'll look into the current call for revival and reformation and the shaking of the church. Perhaps we can finish with a special symbolic event to show what needs to happen and what will happen. Now, that sounds interesting. Care to elaborate on the event? You will see.
In 1873, Ellen White wrote testimony number 23, The Laodicean Church. It can be found in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, beginning on page 252. She begins by saying, The message to the Church of the Laodiceans is a startling denunciation and is applicable to the people of God at the present time. In previous episodes, we have seen how the Seventh-day Adventist Church is still in this Laodicean condition. Unfortunately, the Church has not improved. Like ancient Israel, it has gradually become worse. Today, there is very little difference between Seventh-day Adventists and the fallen denominations. In the same chapter in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, Ellen White wrote, Sin prevails among the people of God. The plain message of rebuke to the Laodiceans is not received. Many cling to their doubts and their darling sins while they are in so great a deception as to talk and feel that they are in need of nothing. They think the testimony of the Spirit of God in reproof is uncalled for or that it does not mean them. They lack almost every qualification necessary to perfect Christian character. This is a deplorable state to be in. The problem with God's last day church is that people cannot discern their true condition. They have become confused between what is right and wrong, truth and error. Consequently, they are unable to form a perfect Christian character which is so essential. Ellen White wrote, All must perfect Christian character for themselves. If we have no interest to avail ourselves of the benefits provided at such an immense cost, our retribution will have been justly earned. The Laodicean message presents Jesus as a patient and loving Savior. He points out our faults and encourages us to accept His counsel. But He also tells us that if we refuse His warning, He will spew us out of His mouth. God will prove His people. Jesus bears patiently with them and does not spew them out of His mouth in a moment, said the angel, God is weighing His people. For many years, Jesus has been weighing His people. He sends them warnings to see whether they will accept them. Back in Testimonies for the Church, Ellen White wrote, But the message of the true witness reveals the fact that a terrible deception is upon our people, which makes it necessary to come to them with warnings, to break their spiritual slumber, and arouse them to decided action. When God's people reject His warnings, there is nothing else He can do but send judgments. We saw an example of these judgments take place in 1902 with the burning of the Battle Creek Sanitarium and Review and Herald office. I am instructed that those who follow on in a wrong course, regardless of the lessons taught by the burning of the sanitarium and the Review and Herald office, are revealing the stubbornness of Pharaoh. They are refusing to be admonished by the judgments of heaven and are pressing on without realizing that these things call them to search their hearts closely and humble themselves before God. Unless they repent, the Lord will surely repeat His judgments as He repeated them to the king of Egypt. God bears long with the perversity of men. He sends them decided reproofs and clear light. But if they will not receive the warnings of God, if they persist in following their own will, their own impulses, the Lord will send His judgments and will not pardon their persistent determination to be like the people of the world. Because God is so patient and loving, He sends small judgments at first. But if His people refuse to accept the lesson taught by these judgments, he will send more severe judgments, just like He did with Jerusalem in days of Jeremiah. 
God has sent warnings to his people through Ellen White, but neither church leaders nor members have heeded the counsels. Some of the problems we have talked about in this series include the acceptance of new theology over true theology. The everlasting gospel has been watered down until it is no different from the false gospel taught by other denominations. The Bible is no longer taken as it reads. Higher criticism denies a literal six-day creation of this world and everything on it. The Church has put aside the Holy Spirit's leading in three general conference sessions where women's ordination was rejected. Now the unity of the Church is threatened and the authority of the Scriptures is being undermined. The issue of homosexuality is following close on the heels of women's ordination as it uses the same arguments which undermine the Scriptures. The spirit of prophecy has been made of none effect by many Seventh-day Adventists. The Church is involved in ecumenism, which seeks to unite all the world's religions under the leadership of the Pope. God is no longer worshipped according to the principles given in the Bible and spirit of prophecy. Instead, Seventh-day Adventist churches are unknowingly worshipping Satan. Throughout the last decade, Spiritualism steadily crept into the church. By means of mystical meditation, people are learning how to get in touch with God in their hearts. Many of our hospitals are no different to their worldly counterparts. The true way of healing is no longer practiced. Our hospitals are no longer avenues for teaching the three angels' messages. Some of them even promote New Age philosophies like meditation and yoga. Even our educational system has not escaped the corrupting influence of the Laodicean condition. In many of our schools, children are being educated to love the world instead of being taught how to get ready for heaven. Of course there's a lot more wrong with the church than these issues. We have only mentioned the most obvious ones. What has the church come to? Does anybody care anymore? Continuing in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, Ellen White writes, The people of God must see their wrongs and arouse to zealous repentance and the putting away of those sins which have brought them into such a deplorable condition of poverty, blindness, wretchedness, and fearful deception. I was shown that the pointed testimony must live in the church. This alone will answer to the message to the Laodiceans. Wrongs must be reproved, sin must be called sin, and iniquity must be met promptly and decidedly and put away from us as a people. At the age of eight, Josiah inherited a kingdom that was in deep apostasy. His father, Ammon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, had led Judah into such abominable practices that only severe judgments could remedy the situation. Early in his reign, Josiah sought to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. At the age of 12, he began to remove the altars of Balaam. When he was 25, the book of the law was found in the temple. It had been lost since the days of Manasseh. As the king read the prophecies of swift judgment upon those who should persist in rebellion, he trembled for the future. The perversity of Judah had been great. What was to be the outcome of their continued apostasy? Alarmed by what he read, Josiah sought word from Huldah, the prophetess. Could the judgments of God be averted? Through Huldah, the Lord sent Josiah word that Jerusalem's ruin could not be averted. Even should the people now humble themselves before God, they could not escape their punishment. So long had their senses been deadened by wrongdoing that if judgment should not come upon them, they would soon return to the same sinful course. 
Because of his humiliation and promptness in seeking forgiveness and mercy, Josiah was comforted with the words that the coming judgments would not take place during his reign. But in announcing the retributive judgments of heaven, the Lord had not withdrawn opportunity for repentance and reformation. And Josiah, discerning in this a willingness on the part of God to temper his judgments with mercy, determined to do all in his power to bring about decided reforms. Josiah was so determined to bring about a revival and reformation that, in the reformation that followed, the king turned his attention to the destruction of every vestige of idolatry that remained. Josiah managed to avert God's judgment for a time, but only because the reform movement he led was a genuine reformation. Today, church leaders are talking about revival and reformation, but is it genuine? On July 3, 2010, Ted Wilson, the newly elected General Conference President, gave his inaugural speech to the delegates of the 59th General Conference session in Atlanta. Wilson reminded the delegates that we are God's peculiar people and that our mission is to lift up Christ. His righteousness, his three angels messages of Revelation 14 and his soon coming. He spoke of the significance of the Sabbath, of justification and sanctification, and the spirit of prophecy. He specifically singled out the great controversy. He warned against spiritual formation that is rooted in mysticism with such practices as contemplative prayer, centering prayer, and the emerging church movement in which they are promoted. He also warned against accepting any form of evolution that denies the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Wilson finished his sermon with the following. I invite you to remain standing and now turn to the person next to you or behind you and in heartfelt, humble prayer, plead with the Lord for revival and reformation so the Holy Spirit can lead God's remnant church as we go forward proclaiming God's grace and the three angels' messages. Please pray together. After such a rousing speech that hit all the right chords, many in the church wondered if Ted Wilson was raised up as a Josiah for our time to lead the church into a time of true revival and reformation and to prepare it for the latter rain. But was he? Among the mountains of Gilead, east of the Jordan, dwelt Elijah the prophet. He was a man of great faith and prayer. As he saw Israel going deeper and deeper into idolatry, his soul was distressed and his indignation aroused. Viewing the nation's apostasy from his mountain retreat, he was overwhelmed with sorrow. In anguish of soul, he besought God to arrest the once favored people in their wicked course, to visit them with judgments, if need be that they might be led to see in its true light their departure from heaven. He longed to see them brought to repentance before they should go to such lengths and evil doing as to provoke the Lord to destroy them utterly. God answered his servant's prayer. Elijah was instructed to appear before King Ahab and declare that he would withhold the rain and do because of the overwhelming abominations that existed in the land. For three and a half years, the land received no rain. There is only one remedy to correct this problem. For stricken Israel, there was but one remedy, a turning away from the sins that had brought upon them the chastening hand of the Almighty and a turning to the Lord with full purpose of heart. It was to bring to pass this blessed result that God continued to withhold from them the dew and the rain until a decided reformation should take place. Not until a true reformation took place would God send the rain, and Elijah was used to bring about this reformation. The word of faith and power was upon his lips, and his whole life was devoted to the work of reform. His was a voice of one crying in the wilderness to rebuke sin and press back the tide of evil. And while he came to the people as a reprover of sin, his message offered the balm of Gilead to the sin-sick souls of all who desire to be healed. This event has great significance for us today.
The Apostle Paul wrote, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The word in samples in this verse is the Greek word tupos. It is also translated as a pattern or figure. We know it today as a type or an illustration of what will take place at a later time. The Passover ceremonies were a type of Christ's death on the cross. Ellen White informs us that the Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. The story of Elijah is one of those great events that will be repeated in these last days. Because of their apostasy, God withheld the rain from his people. The same is true for us today. The latter rain has been withheld and it doesn't matter how much we pray for it, it will not fall until a true revival and reformation take place. In Josiah's day, it required removing every trace of Baal worship. In Elijah's time, the work was the same. The people needed to turn away from all the abominations they were practicing. This happened only after God sent fire down from heaven and all the false prophets of Baal were killed. With the slaying of the prophets of Baal, the way was open for carrying forward a mighty spiritual reformation among the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. Elijah had set before the people their apostasy. He had called upon them to humble their hearts and turn to the Lord. The judgments of heaven had been executed. The people had confessed their sins and had acknowledged the God of their fathers as a living God. And now the curse of heaven was to be withdrawn and the temporal blessings of life renewed. The land was to be refreshed with rain. The message for us is plain. Not until the church is completely cleansed from all its apostasy will it experience a true revival and reformation followed by the outpouring of the latter rain. The current call from the General Conference President will never achieve this until, like ancient Israel, all sin is put away. God calls for a thorough purification of households and institutions. There is need, not merely of a revival, but of a reformation. Every church needs to be stirred as never before. When the great light that God has given shines forth through human agencies, a great work will be done. In demonstration of the Spirit and with power, the truth will be revealed in clear, distinct lines. Instead of the church being purified under the leadership of Ted Wilson, it has become worse. Entire conferences have rebelled against the decisions of previous General Conference sessions. They have ordained women pastors, setting an example and precedent for any church member or institution to tread the path of rebellion. In his 2010 speech, Wilson warned against accepting false views of creation, yet the Sabbath school lesson for the first quarter of 2013 taught false views of creation to the world church. Again, in his 2010 speech, Wilson warned against prayers that are steeped in mysticism, yet the January 2011 issue of Adventist World advertised John Dibdahl's book, Hunger, Satisfying the Longing of Your Soul, as a resource for revival and reformation. This book is saturated with exactly what Wilson warned against. During the 2010 General Conference session, Elder Wilson pledged to distribute the book, The Great Controversy, around the world. And the Great Controversy project began. Elder Wilson further promoted the project through satellite broadcast to millions of church members, leading many to think that The Great Controversy would be distributed. The North American Division created a website, sharethegreathope.com, claiming it would shake the world because they planned to share more than 170 million copies of the book around the globe. 
Sadly, the great controversy project has turned out to be nothing but a great hoax. The name of the book was changed to The Great Hope and reduced to just 11 small chapters. Many donated to this project thinking they were helping the great controversy to be distributed. A good number of essential truths contained in the real great controversy are not found in this easy read version. Noticeably absent are subjects like the cleansing of the sanctuary and investigative judgment the three angels messages, the work of Luther and the reformers, the 1,260 years of papal persecution, and the list goes on. Now there is nothing wrong with distributing cut down versions of the great controversy. That is not the issue. People have been doing that for years because it is cheaper and not as intimidating to pick up and read. The problem is that people have been led to believe that the entire great controversy that Ellen White wrote is being distributed. In the majority of cases, this is not happening. People have been deceived. True revival and reformation do not consist of empty words. Instead, they will bring about decided changes. The good news is, God will bring about a true revival and reformation, followed by the latter rain. The bad news is it will not happen the way many expect. In the sixth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, Ezekiel was shown in vision the condition of God's people, particularly the leaders. In vision, he saw four abominations in the temple of God, each one worse than the one before it. Regarding the last abomination, Ezekiel was shown, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Through the spiritual leaders, Satan had brought all kinds of abominable practices into God's sanctuary. The worst abomination was the last. About 25 leaders had turned their backs on God and worshipped the sun toward the east. The abominations for which the faithful ones were sighing and crying were all that could be discerned by finite eyes. But by far the worst sins, those which provoked the jealousy of the pure and holy God were unrevealed. The great searcher of hearts knoweth every sin committed in secret by the workers of iniquity. I wonder whether it is happening today in God's last day church. Might the worst of those abominations that of worshiping the sun be hidden from the people? Ezekiel says that about 25 men were committing this abomination. Does this have any significance for us today? During the reorganization of the General Conference back in 1901, it was decided that the executive committee of this conference shall be 25 in number and shall have power to organize itself by choosing a chairman, secretary, treasurer, and auditor whose duties shall be such as usually pertain to their respective offices. It shall also have the power to appoint all necessary agents and committees for the conduct of its work. In the Constitution, Bylaws and Working Policy, Article 5, Section 1B, April 1959, page 9, we are told that the Executive Committee was not to exceed 25 in number. Sometime after 1959, the committee was enlarged greatly. However, another committee was formed to control the General Conference Committee. According to the following letter, the number of that committee was about 25 or 26. 
Here at the General Conference, the highest decision-making committee, of course, is the General Conference Committee. There is a committee that we term General Conference Officers, which is made up of about 25 or 26 individuals, president, secretaries, and treasurers, with a few other invited individuals. This committee is a screening committee that determines the items that need to go to the General Conference Committee. This number was confirmed by the Adventist News Network in 2012. The document, An Appeal for Unity and Respect to Ministerial Ordination Practices, written and approved by all General Conference officers, 25 in number, and division presidents, 13 persons worldwide, makes this clear. Is it a coincidence that Ezekiel's description of about 25 sun worshippers in the Temple of God is the same description that came from the General Conference office? No, it is not. In 1909, Ellen White wrote, Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled, yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. The ninth chapter of Ezekiel is part of the same vision that starts in chapter 8, where the prophet saw the 25 sun worshippers. Therefore, to understand chapter 9, we have to study chapter 8 as well. In the letter to A.R. Henry, Ellen White also wrote, We are amid the perils of the last days. The time will soon come when the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. That prophecy should be carefully studied, for it will be fulfilled to the very letter. The 11th and 12th chapters also should receive critical, thoughtful attention. In Ezekiel 11, he sees another group of 25 people. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jezaniah the son of Azur, and Pelatiah the son of Beniah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. Is God trying to tell us something? Whereas the 25 sun worshippers in chapter 8 were priests, this group of people are princes of the people. Their responsibility consisted of directing the affairs of the city. In the two groups numbering 25, we have a complete representation of the general conference officers responsible for guiding the affairs of the church. Those were not the only ones Ezekiel saw who were responsible for the abominations in the church. He also saw 70 elders worshiping abominable images in a secret room. In the Bible, the number 70 represents the leadership. Moses appointed 70 elders. The Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men, and Jesus chose 70 disciples. Is it possible we have come to the point where much of the Seventh-day Adventist leadership is corrupt? Yes. Throughout this series, we have seen many leaders in responsible positions not upholding the truths of God's Word. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet are careless and stupid and ministers have no power to arouse them. They're asleep themselves. Sleeping preachers preaching to a sleeping people. Since they receive some of their religious education from institutions outside the church, is it any wonder so many leaders have become corrupt? One particular favorite is Fuller Theological Seminary, one of the world's largest. They offer a doctorate in ministry that seems too good for Seventh-day Adventists to pass up. 
notice some of the subjects required to complete the doctorate at Fuller Theological Seminary. At least 12 of their subjects fall into the spiritual formation category. This ought to be a warning about what is taught at this institute and who is behind it. One course is titled Spiritual Formation and Discipleship in a Postmodern World. In case you have not watched episode 9, discipleship in today's postmodern world is spiritual formation. Who in their right mind would go to a seminary where Catholic and New Age philosophies are taught? Sadly, the following professors from Andrews University thought it would help them. Alan Walsh, Associate Professor of Youth Ministry, Bruce L. Bauer, Professor of World Mission, Edward E. Schmidt, Assistant Professor of Personal Evangelism, P. Richard Choi, Professor of New Testament, Ricardo Norton, Associate Professor of Church Growth, Ronnie M. Clouset, Professor of Christian Ministry and Pastoral Theology, Skip Bell, Professor of Christian Ministry, Wagner Kuhn, Professor of World Mission and Intercultural Studies, and some professors from Avondale College in Australia also felt the need to attend Fuller to upgrade their qualifications. Dr. Barry Gain, Head of School of Ministry and Theology, Dr. Doug Roberson, Senior Lecturer of Ministry and Theology, and Dr. Lyle Heiss, Director and Senior Lecturer of Ministry and Theology. There are many other leaders who have received their education from Fuller Theological Seminary, but we don't have time to list them all. Please keep in mind that Fuller is not the only non-Adventist institute where our leaders are choosing to receive their religious training. As Seventh-day Adventists, our purpose is to call people out of Babylon, yet many of our leaders are going to Babylon to receive their education. In the early 20th century, Ellen White warned our people not to go to Battle Creek to be educated in case they would be deceived by Dr. Kellogg's pantheism. If she were alive today, would she not warn our people against attending universities like Fuller, where they would be trained in spiritual formation and other erroneous teachings? Those leading the church, from the very top at the General Conference to local congregations, should be men who are led by the Holy Spirit. They should have spiritual discernment regarding what is right and what is wrong. Ellen White warns, the plain, straight testimony must live in the church or the curse of God will rest upon His people as surely as it did upon ancient Israel because of their sins. God holds His people as a body responsible for the sins existing in individuals among them. If the leaders of the church neglect to diligently search out the sins which bring the displeasure of God upon the body, they become responsible for these sins. One has to wonder what kind of discernment the General Conference has when they approved funding of nearly one million dollars to produce The Record Keeper an 11-part web-based series that dramatizes themes from the Great Controversy. The drama focuses on three fictitious angels, one good and one bad, as well as a female angel who has been charged to keep a record of the conflict between good and evil. Apparently, the series was inspired by the Great Hope, the abridged version of the Great Controversy. rebelled against your king. This punishment is too severe, Kate. Death is the worst thing we've ever seen. It changes you. You've never had a dream, have you? It's because this hasn't affected you yet. But it will. What do you call an angel without any power? Human. <laughs> this is not a battlefield. This is the home of proof. I thought you said he loved us. I have tried. Save you, my brother. They're creating loopholes for the human. They're changing the game. They're changing the game. There are no secrets. Okay. 
The record keeper was approved by the General Conference. The executive producer was General Conference PR director Garrett Caldwell. Two other executive producers were Ben Schoen and Delbert Baker, both vice presidents of the General Conference. The film was directed by Jason Satterland, owner of Big Puddle Films. One look at what he has produced, as seen on his website, should have warned the General Conference about what they were getting themselves into. Interestingly, when Satterland and Caldwell were asked if they had experienced any resistance to the record keeper because it used drama, they said, no. The most I've seen is people posting Ellen White quotes that have been taken out of context under videos that have been posted online. But the vast majority of people have been very supportive, Satterland said. Adding later, if you're conservative and don't watch movies, then this isn't for you. In mid-April 2014, the General Conference released a news report stating that the Record Keeper series had been suspended due to, quote, problematic and theologically inaccurate matters. Many were glad to see the General Conference suspend this drama production, but few realized it was the General Conference who approved and funded it in the first place. As already stated, Ben Schoen and Delbert Baker both General Vice Presidents of the General Conference are listed as executive producers. Now think about it. Almost a million dollars of tithe offerings or both were wasted on this drama production which was approved at the highest level of the church, even though it included theologically inaccurate content. The General Conference Administration has quietly wiped its hands of this apostasy when in fact, they should be held responsible. Ellen White says a lot about drama, and none of it is positive. She was horrified when the first page of a Signs of the Times issue dedicated an article to Shakespeare, widely regarded as the world's preeminent dramatist. Drama is Satan's way of making us love the world. According to Satterland, those who enjoy watching The Record Keeper will not be conservative and will enjoy watching movies. In Philippians 4.8, Paul counseled, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We're fooling ourselves if we think we can use worldly methods to win souls to Christ. We need leaders who will stand up and make decisions based upon the Word of God. Not until the church is purified from its apostasy will the latter rain fall and the loud cry be given. Ezekiel 9 reveals how God will accomplish this. In language that cannot be mistaken, the prophet describes the judgment of God on his unfaithful people, not only of ancient Israel, but of his last day remnant, the seventh day Adventist church. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth 
and slew in the city. According to Ellen White, in these last days, this prophecy will be fulfilled literally, to the very letter. This means that the church, symbolized by the sanctuary, will be the first to receive the wrath of God. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interest of the people, had betrayed their trust. Like the Jews in Jerusalem, many have a false sense of security, thinking that the events of Ezekiel 9 will take place after probation closes. They have failed to realize that the sanctuary was the first to feel the stroke of God. The Lord will work to purify His church. I tell you in truth, the Lord is about to turn and overturn in the institutions called by His name. Just how soon this refining process will begin, I cannot say, but it will not be long deferred. He whose fan is in his hand will cleanse his temple of its moral defilement. He will thoroughly purge his floor. God has a controversy with all who practice the least injustice. I appeal to my brethren to wake up. Unless a change takes place speedily, I must give the facts to the people, for this state of things must change. Unconverted men must no longer be managers and directors in so important and sacred work. With David, we are forced to say, it is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. As soon as the church is cleansed, it will be ready to receive the latter rain. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not labors together with God. God cannot pour out His Spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifest, when His Spirit prevails that, if put into words, would express that answer of, Cain, am I my brother's keeper? Many feel that as long as they keep the Sabbath, they will receive the mark or seal of God. But God requires not only Sabbath observance, but a people who are not participating in the apostasy that exists in the church. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such, and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. The church at large is not sighing and crying for the abominations done in its midst. As Laodicea, our spiritual eyesight has been diminished, and yet we think we are all right. Like the inhabitants of Jerusalem, we feel secure, believing that we are on the right boat that will safely make it to the harbor. The boat will make it to the harbor, but most people do not realize that the passage on the way to the harbor is treacherous, and many will be thrown overboard and lose their lives. Satan will work his miracles to deceive, he will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. The church will go through, but it won't be the church as we know it today. It will be a considerably smaller, purified church.
Okay, Ernie. Well, hey, Isabel, I'm glad you made it. Uh, well, you know, I'm really curious to find out, what did you learn? Well, Ernie, there's no escaping the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in apostasy, and because of it, and because it has not repented, God is going to send judgments on His church to purify it. Well, you know, Ellen White said the church would appear to fall. This gives us an idea of how bad it will get. Only through God's intervention will His church be saved. Wow, and she says it's going to be a terrible ordeal. Yes, it will be. You know, Ezekiel 9 says, He will not have any pity on those who are guilty of apostasy, old, young, women, and even little children will lose their lives. And that's precisely what you were shown in your dream final events in the first supper, Ernie. Yes. You know, in a small way, I understand how Ezekiel or Jeremiah must have felt. They knew what was going to happen, but people refused to listen. It must have been very disheartening. Yes, if you had seen the things I was shown, it is very disheartening. God has warned His people, first in the Bible, secondly in the writings of Ellen White, and now He has given them one last warning through my dreams. These are the three witnesses. What more can He do? So what was that special symbolic event you hinted at earlier? Well, you will remember I said it was a symbolic deck of what needs to happen and what will happen. Let me read to you from The Real Great Controversy, and then perhaps then you will understand. But Luther was fearless still. Rome had hurled her anathemas against him, and the world looked on, nothing doubting that he would perish or be forced to yield. But with terrible power, he flung back upon herself the sentence of condemnation and publicly declared his determination to abandon her forever. In the presence of a crowd of students, doctors, and citizens of all ranks, Luther burned the Pope's bull with the canon laws. The decretals and certain writings sustaining the papal power, my enemies have been able by burning my books, he said to injure the cause of the truth in the minds of some and destroy souls. For this reason, I consume their books in return. A serious struggle has just commenced. Hitherto, I have been playing with the Pope. Now I wage open war. I began this work in God's name. It will be ended without me and by His might. You know, Ernie, so I'm wondering, uh, what are you proposing? Well, you know, Isabel, I need to get something first so that I can show you what I'm talking about here. Let me uh, just go down here and let me bring something up to you so that, you know, sometimes a visual image works much better. Well, you know, I want to start off by showing a book here. It's, it's the Seventh-day Adventist Answer, Questions on Doctrine. Oh yeah, I remember. That was back in the 50s, and it talked, I think thanks to that, come to think of it, is when the new theology started and the sanctuary message got all changed around. It talks about the nature of Christ, the original sin. Well, you know, this book, there's only one thing that could be done with this book, and this is what this book is good for. Oh my. Now, I want to talk about another book. This next book is called The Nature of Christ. I read that By one. Roy Adams. Yeah. All right, this book, it talks about how you can't stop sinning. It talks about the nature of Christ. I remember that book. It had a lot of interesting things about how we're going to continue sinning until the very end. You know what we need to do with this book? Same as the other one. Like that. Let me show you another book. This one's also by Roy Adams. It's called The Sanctuary. You know, this book here, it's Sanctuary in Heaven and that it's not real. Would you like to have the honors? Wow. Let's see. Go there. There you go. Okay. 
Do you have any more? This is interesting. Yes, I do. You know, it's through books like those that people are being deceived and apostasy exists in the church. Just as Martin Luther burned the Pope's bull, I believe that we as a church and individually need to remove all that offends God and humbly seek his forgiveness. Only then will he heal us. But if we refuse to reform the church and our lives, if we continue to pray for the outpouring of the Spirit while making no effort to remove the apostasy, God will purify it himself with fire. The choice is ours. Well, Isabel, you know, we've got the fire going, but we've got a lot more books and a lot more magazines to burn. Oh, wow. So, you know, before we get more books and magazines, we need to get the fire hotter. So I'm gonna get some more wood to throw on here. Let me see what you've got. <clears throat> oh, this is Ministry Magazine from February 2000. No, oh, yeah, there was an article here by Richard Coffin that basically rejected the spirit of prophecy, talking about problems with chronology and her historicity. And this one by Bakioki also downplays Ellen White, saying that pretty much you have to reject it because there are some errors in her history. You know what? I am going to have fun with it. I think you should. Oh, Whoa, that went a little that, bit too far. A little far. too far. Let's crumple this one up and get a little closer. There we go. Close okay. enough. It'll burn. Whoa, okay. Well, we have some more books that we want to burn. Okay. Let me get some more books. And, well, Isabel, this is going to be from episode five. We talked about evolution and the gap theory. And I want to present three books, but the first two are by Brian Bull and Fritz Guy. You know, these books, they, they cover Genesis 1 and how it's not scientific, and its purpose is to reveal God. Fritz Guy, oh my. He was a Bible teacher at La Sierra, and he doesn't believe in Genesis. You know what, Ernie? May I have the honor of tossing this into absolutely, the fire? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's build the fire up. There we go. Well, you know, the next one is Understanding Genesis, Contemporary Adventist Perspectives. This is also by Brian Bull and Fritz Guy. You know, this one here promotes the old earth theory. Genesis is not literal, and the flood was not worldwide. This, again, was taught where? Probably at La Sierra, knowing our luck here. Then I am going to toss it in. Well, this third book... It's actually a Sabbath school lesson study. And this is so sad. You know, this is the Seventh Day Adventist denomination, Sabbath school quarterly. This is for January, February, March of 2013. It was entitled Origins. This quarterly that was taught in our churches, this promotes an old earth and sun. This was taught to our people in their Sabbath school classes. People need to wake up. They're being taught false things. This is what they should be doing with this kind of false things. In a fire with it. Now, you know, the next books and magazines I have is from episode six. Let me bring these over to you. I have a couple magazines here for you. The first one you'll see is from Ministry Magazine. Ministry, July 2013. Oh, this one is uh, Nancy Feemeister's article on women apostles. Women's ordination is a theology of ordination from the South Pacific Division's Biblical Research Committee and from the South Pacific Union Record, October 2008. Way back then, they were already talking about homosexuality. Oh my, you know what? These are going you want to go, to have you the know honor, where. You? Just yes. gently place them up there so you can see them burn. And that's the way they should be. This wow. is what they're good for, Isabel. Oh this my. is all they're good for. If people would burn this kind of stuff more, it would be better. 
as that goes up in flames. I have a, another book I want to show you. This is another one by uh, David Ferguson, Fritz Guy, and David Larson. This one is on homosexuality. Christianity and Christianity homosexuality. And homosexuality. Oh my. Some Seventh-day Adventist perspectives. Wow. You know, this book has one place. It's not in the house. It's not on a bookcase. It has one place that it should go. And once you see how this goes up in flames. You know, I have more to show you. Okay, I'm all ears. You know, this was from episode six. Let me get some from episode seven to show you. I have two books and another magazine. This first magazine, I'll let you read the front cover. This is from Andrews University Focus. Oh, wow. This is when students went to a mosque and they were, wow. They had to prepare themselves to pray in the mosque. Mm -hmm. That's it. Wow. They washed up. Oh, my. This is, this is blasphemy, Ernie. Yes, it is. And you know what you should be done with it? I'm going to do it. This is what people need to do. I have a book here. I'll hand it to you and you can read about it. Oh, Samir Selmanovics, it's all, really all about God. Oh my. I went to a spiritual retreat with Brennan Manning, a Franciscan priest who spoke about the love of God in a way that helped thousands of pastors like me Hang, he was a true evangelical mystic. Excuse me. <laughs> there are more onto it. Well, I have another one here. This is a DVD set by Dr. Samuel Bakayoki. And this is Seal of God, How It's Not the Sabbath. It weakens identifying points of the beast in Revelation. You know, this is what a lot of people have watched, and there's one place for that. Do you want to do the honors? Do you no, want you to? go right ahead because right. I'm waiting to throw this one in myself. And what's that? What do you have there? Well, Isabel, I'm holding a book written by Samuel Bakioki. It's a historical investigation of the rise of Sunday observance in early Christianity. Oh, I remember. He said that what John says in Revelation about being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, that was not Sabbath, as Ellen White says. The only thing it should be is fired. Let's add this to the list of books that should be burned. We'll let that one burn. Well, do you want to see some more? Oh, wow. This is getting better and better. We'll let that one burn and let me get some more, more books. The next books will be from episode eight, and this was on worship. The first one is Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Church. Oh my, it, it's even autographed. What a deal. Do you know that this book is recommended to our student pastors at Andrews at how to grow their churches? Oh, there's more. Do you know I hold a book here called Getting It Right? This is published and printed by the Seventh-day Adventist Review in Hagerstown, Maryland. This is the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Youth Department. If you, lead, if you read through this, you'll find where it talks of uh, oh. Campolo. Oh my. It references this. You know, there's only one thing here you can have that this these one too. books should be done. All right. There's only one thing. Purpose driven church. Well, there is a purpose for this book, and it is to feed the fire. I have more to share with you. Oh wow. You know, this was covered from episode nine. I have many things to show you. The first one's on contemplative prayer. Oh, Thomas Merton's contemplative prayer. Yeah, this book is uh, quite popular with some pastors. I'll trade you. Wounded Healer by Henry Nguyen. 
He says that uh, Jesus was a mystic and wants people to imitate that type of a life of prayer. Oh my. Well, this is bad, but I want you to notice the Seventh-day Adventist review. As you look at that, you know, there's something that we have to do with these two books, Isabel. They have to be burned with the rest. What is a mystic? Oh my, mysticism in the review. This is only a year ago, January 2013. I'm going to put this one in myself. You have the honors. And as you get ready to come back, I have Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. Oh yes, there's some pastors that recommend this book also. Yeah, this is not the way to worship God. Well, I'll trade you again. Let me okay, take that. Okay, what else do you have? And I'll give you these three reviews, and I'm going to go add this to the burning stack. Oh my, this is, it actually promotes that book you just threw in the fire. The review recommending it? It actually here. does. Oh, wow. This review actually recommended the book that we knew was the only thing good to do with, throw it in the fire. So this article that was written out of the Adventist Review, well, it doesn't even deserve to be thrown in. It needs to be waddled up first. Oh, wow. These also have... This is actually an interview with Richard Foster, the author of that book, in the review. You know, in fact, this article says that discipleship is spiritual formation. So that tells me, because it's in the official church uh, magazine, that when we talk about discipleship now, we have to be thinking what they really are referring to is spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. This is going you know where. Well, I have two more books for you. And I'll tell you what. While you look at this, I'm going to get more wood for the fire. I want you to look at this and tell me what you think about it. Wow, this is Dallas Willard. Yeah. What is it the about, Isabel? The Spirit Isabelle? of the Disciplines. He's rec Richard Foster recommends him. And uh, these are both by Dallas Willard. You know what, while you're doing that, may I add these? I think that would be a good idea. I just want to keep the fire going because we have more to burn. Well, it's time to get some more books. I have some more here for you and I'm just gonna bring them up and let you look at it. This is information you've already reviewed and read. I don't think any of this is gonna be shocking or surprising to you. Hunger, John Dibdahl, yep. This is quite, quite the book. It's interesting because he quotes the people that we were burning there, Foster and Dallas Willard and Henry Newwin the Catholic and Tony Campolo, and he promotes some of the wrong types of prayers. He promotes the centering, the meditation, the breath prayers, Francis of Assisi. This is, I'm sorry, but this is wrong. May I have the honor? You, you may. All right, this you is may. the book Hunger. You may. And this one, this is from the Adventist Review, January 2011. And right here in the Revival and Reformation Resource Cent uh, section, it promotes the book you just put in the fire. Oh my, it actually has a picture of it right there. Yeah, I see that. And uh, this is from the Sabbath School from La Sierra, uh, where it talks about a prayer labyrinth. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yes. that is wrong. Adventist Chaplain, July, September 2003. This one promotes spiritual direction and attending retreats of several religions. They call those the interfaith retreats. I'm sorry, that is wrong. And look, Adventist News Network, an ANN feature, church and congregations increase their focus on spiritual formation. Mm. 
This one is another news break about how Adventist educators are trying to reach the postmoderns and it urges ministerial training schools to include a class in experiential spiritual formation in their curricula. Oh, we're gonna have more for the fire. We are. The Andrews University Doctor of Ministry concentration uh, was preparing people for the ministry with discipleship and spiritual formation, but due to the backlash, they changed the name. And now they don't say it's spiritual formation, but they call it biblical spirituality. But it's the same, just a different name. From Avondale, this is the undergraduate schedule, current, and one of the classes in the Bachelor of Ministry and Theology is Spiritual Formation for Pastoral Ministry. Enjoy. Well, I will. This will take the place with everything else. This kind of stuff, if our people could only realize, maybe the church could be cleansed. Unfortunately, it has to be cleansed like that with fire. Well, I have more. All right, Isabel, I have more for you. It's going to start off with a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. Oh, that's Here a popular go. one. There's, there's people who really like this. You know, this author is a Catholic, and he recommends meditation, mysticism, contemplative prayer, those things that we should not be involved with. Wow. And this is a ministry magazine. Dwight Nelson oh, wait. is who Dwight did you say? Nelson recommending this. Look at this. Dwight Nelson is oh, recommending this? And you know this? who else Who else likes Ragamuffin Gospel and recommends it is Matt Gamble. He's currently the pastor of Elms Haven Church, the very church that is a stone's throw from where Ellen White lived. Max Lucado, he is a very popular author, has written many, many, many books. In fact, I've seen several of his books at the ABC, and he's very popular. He talks about spiritualism and ecumenism, and people don't realize that. Mark Iaconelli, you know, this is on contemplative youth ministries. And the interesting thing is that he is quoted. It's promote, this book is promoted in the French a website of the Ellen G. White estate mm. promoting this kind of thing. He talks about centering prayer, Lectio Divina, meditation, and all those kinds of things. Well, you know, all of this, there's only one place for these kind of things. And again, if so few seem to be learning it now, this is something that so many Adventists need to know that if they had these kind of things, they should not take them and throw them in their trash. They should build a fire and do what we're doing. Because this kind of stuff, there's only one thing can be done with it. An article like this in Ministry Magazine promoting how Dwight Nelson supports. That is not good. That is not good, Isabel. Max Lucado's book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, Contemplative youth ministry, only one place, in the fire. In the fire now or when God purifies with fire. Well, Isabel, the next part we've already covered, it's, it's episode 10. It's on health. And I just have two things that I want to share with you. We've already talked about this, but sometimes it's good just to go over it again. You know, we went on to the Florida Hospital for Children's website. We've talked about how the Florida Hospital has partnered with Disney. Oh, Disney. You know, Becky and I went out to Florida last year and we went in and we toured the Florida Hospital and we went into the children's wing. We were surprised when out comes an escorted Star Wars characters group, you know, Darth Vader, the Stormtroopers, oh, you remember my. Star Wars. Star Wars. But that movie, as well as so many others of Disney, are so full of spiritualism, the force within you and all this other stuff that shouldn't be. Well, I have something else. 
Oh my. You know, we went to the St. Helena Hospital. We're talking the hospital that is right next to Elmshaven. Well, at the St. Helena Hospital, they have a tree called the Hope Tree. Beck and I went over and we wanted to take a look at that. Oh, at the cancer center. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we do with them what we do with everything else? It's supposed to be a healing tree. This does not belong in our Seventh-day Adventist institution. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. Well, there's Please. only one place for it. Okay, Isabel, I have one last book for you. Here's your last book. Oh, wow. I Hope by Nathan Brown. Yes, this book promotes several different types of false theology and authors like Brennan Manning and uh, women's ordination. He talks about homosexuality and ecumenism as positive things. He even talks about the wrong music as something good, about things that well, he basically summarizes everything negative we have talked about. It is very disappointing. It's the last book. We'll let you it join with the others. Enjoy. All right, here's the last book we'll throw in. Well, you know, Isabel, all the books that we've burned, it is to help people understand, you know, People are coming together and they're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're praying and asking for the latter rain. They're praying for the early rain. You know, we can't have the latter rain until we've had the early rain. And yet people want to pray and ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How can we receive such a wonderful gift as the Holy Spirit? How can we receive the early rain unless we as a church are pure, are clean, are whole. We can't receive anything until the cleansing fire has gone through. You know all the books we had? They no longer exist. They are gone. They exist as nothing more than ash and the wind will carry them away and disperse them. Until we can have our church purified with fire, we can never have the outpouring of the early rain. We can never have the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Are you saying, stop recommending these kinds of things so that then God can bless after it's cleaned up? You know, that is one step in the right direction. But honestly, Isabel, I personally do not believe that is going to happen. I believe that each individual has to make that decision for their own salvation. But each individual has to make that decision. But I think the ultimate will be the cleansing fire of God, as spoken of in Ezekiel 9. God wrote about it, and Ellen White has talked about it. We began talking when we started burning the books about the message that I have received. The cleansing fire is coming. Today, we burned a handful of books. Soon, God is going to destroy and cleanse with his fire to make his church pure and whole. Wow. In this documentary series, we have presented enough evidence to show without a doubt that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been steadily going down the path of apostasy for over 50 years. It is in the Laodicean condition. The example of ancient Israel shows where the Seventh-day Adventist Church is headed. As time progresses, the apostasy is growing exponentially. We have almost reached the time when God will say, enough is enough. The sad thing is, that time doesn't have to come. I appeal to the leaders of the church from Ted Wilson, the general conference president, on down to each local church leader. Don't let it happen. Stand up for God, 
for his truth and for his last day church and put a stop to all the apostasy that exists within it. Not until a true revival and reformation take place will God pour out the latter rain. This means openly repenting of and forsaking the apostasy that has been accepted into the church, some of which we have covered in this series. I also appeal to you, the viewer, don't wait for the leadership to change. Israel's history shows that they are unlikely to do anything. Follow the Bible's counsel and call sin by its right name, as Jesus did, in love. Only those who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the church will ever receive the seal of God and the latter rain. If there is anything in your own life that you know is separating you from God, we appeal to you, surrender it now while there is still time. We invite you to visit www.formypeople.org and read the messages God has sent for His people. Soon, very soon, he will wipe away the filth from his church and have a purified church prepared for the latter rain and the finishing of the work. It is our prayer that you will be a part of that number. Mm -hmm.